me turn my phone off. Okay, respected principal and my dear colleagues, I want to greet you in the name of Jesus. And I am Jyoti Subha standing here in front of you to speak on the topic how to set up our priority, our means in our Christian life. So maintaining our priority is important for us because it's the priority that will always channel our life to a certain destination. And being a Christian, God should be number one in our life. And God should be a number one in our life. And in that way, I bring up my first point that is pursuing God. Pursuing God is following Him. Or like if you take the literal meaning of the pursuit, it is chasing, going after something. Um, a question might come to us like, um, it is God who came to save us. It is God who searched a, a, a sinful man. So how do we pursue God? But God came, uh, God came to the earth to establish a relationship over the human beings. And uh, so this relationship has to be two-way. A true relationship, in a true fellowship, in a true relationship, it will always be two-way, not only from one side. And pursuing God, we mean, I mean, it is spending time discovering who He is and also what pleases Him and trusting Him, or following Him, uh, leaving away the things that are not uh, pleasing to Him. Uh, let's uh, look at some of the verses in the Bible. Uh, it, uh, if we look at Psalm number 105 verse 4, there is a command saying, Seek the Lord and His strength, seek His face evermore, uh, seek His face evermore. So, the command is given to us that we have to seek the Lord, we have to seek His strength, we have to seek His face, and we have to do this on a continual basis. We have to seek Him actively and relentlessly. And um, it is not telling that we have to seek the blessings that He will give us or the other things that He's going to give from His side. But we have to seek God to uh, maintain a relationship with Him. Also, uh, there are many verses which um, the Bible. There are many verses in the Bible which uh, they, which are the promises that if we seek Him, then we will we can find Him. For example, Jeremiah chapter twenty nine verse thirteen. It's written there like uh, seek. Uh, when you will seek me, you will find me. When you search for me with all your heart, you are going to find me. So that's a promise that when we seek Him. He is, uh, we will find Him. He is going to come to us to have a relationship with Him. And Psalm number 34 verse 10, it says, The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. It, it, the, per, the people, or, the, or if I seek God, or if I go after Him, uh, I'm not going to suffer, I'm not going to lack anything, but God is, God is going to give what I need. Lamentations 3.25 says, The Lord is good to those who wait for Him and to the, uh, to the soul who seeks Him. God is good to us. God's favor will be upon us. We are not seeking God, I'm, I want to emphasize this, we are not seeking God for what He gives us, but to have an intimate relationship with Him. Also Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 says that, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. These things are those uh, which Jesus has already clarified in the preceding verses. The things that we uh, worry of, like uh, our clothing, our eating, and our, we worry for our health. But uh, Jesus, it's a promise that if we seek God, and if we seek uh, His kingdom, His righteousness, then all these things shall be added unto us. To, uh, uh, for example, uh, I bring out the life of David from the Old Testament. If we look at chapter, uh, Psalm number 27, we see David saying in verse 4, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Uh, uh, commentators say that this, uh, this is a psalm where we find the uh, persecution of David is there, but still he is praising God. Or he is going through some kind of circumstances or situation in his life, yet he is still praising God. Because David was seeking the Lord, and his desire is to seek God and to dwell in the presence of the Lord. And 
Uh, in verse 8 also, David says, God said, like, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, God, I will seek. That's what God also wants uh, from, our, uh, from our life. Therefore, we should make it our aim, just like what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. And therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. So, Paul's highest goal in his life was to seek Him, and while seeking Him, to please Him, to please God. Uh, if you look at John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8, there we find the basis of the Christian living, where Jesus has uh, given a metaphor of a vine, uh, given a metaphor of a vine, and also uh, how a true Christian, a genuine believer, should have a relationship with God. So there we see a vine, uh, a vine, and we are the branches. And Jesus also has made it very clear that we need to abide in Him. And if we don't abide in Him, we don't have any relationship with him then we will not be fruitful in our life uh, Colossians chapter 2 verse 10 also says that we are complete in him unless and until we stay in him we be in him or uh, make him our priority uh, there's no way that we are living, going to live a meaningful life on this earth and the second thing that I want to bring up now is uh, rebuilding altar when we are pursuing God, when we want to have an intimate relationship with God, when we want to know what pleases God, and when we want to trust Him, the rebuilding or the building of an altar is very important in our life. Altar represents a place of true worship for God, and it is a place where we have fellowship uh, with God, where we have communion with Him. Altar uh, can be a personal quiet time, Otherwise, uh, we can also have family altar or also a church altar where the people come together and worship Him, uh, listen to Him through the preaching of the Word and also through the praise and prayer. Uh, we speak to God or we express our love and devotion to Him. But more than that, uh, a building altar in our personal life is very important. If we look at the life of Abraham, we see him building altar wherever he went. Uh, in Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham. He comes from a he comes from a place, a pagan place. And when God calls him, he leaves everything, and then he comes. And uh, Genesis chapter 12 verse 7 says that he came to the land of Canaan and he built an altar there unto the Lord. If we come to verse 8, he has traveled further and he comes to a place between Ai and Bethel. There also he has built the altar unto the Lord. This was a place where Abraham would have fellowship with God. Again, if we come to Genesis chapter 13 verse 4, we see he, uh, he is coming back to that place again. He is building the altar, uh, altar again. If we look at chapter 13 verse 18 again, it says that Abraham dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre in Hebron and he has built the altar, uh, altar unto the Lord. And Abraham, we know, he is the father of faith. And I believe he didn't become the father of faith just by only believing, but also he had maintained a relationship with God. And through the through having that relationship with God, he could become more of God, and then uh, he could understand the will of God, and he could follow what God wanted through his life. And if we uh, go to Ezra chapter three again, there we see the Israelites are uh, the Jewish people are allowed to come back from Babylon to. Judah and they are allowed to settle there. Uh, we see the history of Israel is not always uh, faithfully following the Lord, but they have done some terrible, wicked things, which uh, yeah, because of which God had to discipline them. And now, when they are coming back to their land, the first thing that they do there is building the altar for the God of Israel according to the law of Moses and. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, we can say that Joshua was there as a priest and Jerubbabel as the leader. And that verse says, Joshua, Jerubbabel, and his brethren, brethren arose and built the altar of the God of Israel according to what it was written in the law of Moses. They understood that without building the altar, there is no uh, building of their own life. So that's how they have uh, they have started uh, settling in Judah after their return. And uh, now I want to go to the third point is which starts with I, it is investing time on God's purposes. Uh, let me read that verse Ephesians chapter 5 verse 
15 to 17, which says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. When we are pursuing God, uh, we to have a relationship with Him, we are building an altar, we are having a place of having fellowship with Him, but also we need to be wise in maintaining our time. Your word says that redeeming the time, we have to work circumspectly, we have to work carefully. Uh, the person who uses the time well is a wise person according to this word. We, we have to know how to make the use of time, how to use the opportune time for our life. And as this, uh, according to this point, investing time on God's purposes. There are many things, uh, especially when we live in this world, there are many things, uh, many things come in our life which distracts us from our purposes. Whether it is a purpose that we want to have in this world for the world only, or whether we are whether we are living for the eternal purposes, but there are things that will distract us from uh, getting away from our purpose or fulfilling or target uh, uh, fulfilling the target. So, uh, but we need to know we have to be very careful about using our time. So, redeeming the time, we have to know this. And the fourth point that I want to bring now is overcoming every obstacle. Pursuing God or maintaining God, uh, having God as number one in our life is not a one day work, it is not a temporary thing that we are doing just for in the beginning of our faith life, but it is something that we need to do uh, until the last breath of our life. So while we are in this journey, we, are, we will be facing obstacles, there will be hindrances in, the la in our life. But we need to overcome with faith and endurance. Faith and endurance by trusting in the Lord. It's very important. Endurance is also important because uh, while, when we are on this walk, uh, it's a long way to go. Uh, it's a long way to go and we need that perseverance in our life. When we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8-10, to 10, there we see Paul is talking about the thorn that he had in his flesh and he asked God to remove it. But God has not removed it, but said to him that my grace is sufficient for you. So these uh, hindrances can be uh, inside us, within us, or it can also come from the outside influences. Uh, but, what, uh, but we can overcome every obstacle that comes in our life. Because God's grace is for us. He has promised to give us that strength. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13, again, the Paul is making a wonderful statement here and he is saying that I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. Paul was in the ministry and in that verses he is also telling that I have learned to be content in whatever state I am. So uh, the contentment is also another secret of his success, being able to do everything under the grace of God and when he is having the strength of God. So he is saying I can do everything through Christ, I can overcome the obstacle. And also in John chapter 16 verses 33, Jesus is saying to his disciples like, In the world you will have many tribulations, but be of good cheer. But you need not be worried because I have overcome the world. Since we are following him, he is our master, so uh, victory is ours. We can overcome uh, the obstacle. So the obstacle can be of fear, unbelief, temptation, opposition, sinful habits. There can be many hindrances uh, for, our, for us to... For, uh, for us to go forward but because of the promises that God has given in his word and because of the examples of godly people we can learn from them also take the courage that we can overcome every obstacle in our life for example I bring out the example of Joseph Joseph was a man uh, Joseph while he was a teenager he had a dream and the dream was of the greatness God was predicting something for his life God had a great plan for his life but what do we see before become before going uh, before uh, that uh, dream is uh, finally fulfilled there was a lot of problem in his life he had to face his envious brothers he had to be sold as a slave then he was uh, he had to face the anger of his master's wife and also he has to face the neglect because uh, the person who was to remember him when that person uh, was in the presence of Pharaoh completely forgot him. But uh, we see Joseph being, uh, being uh, enduring all these things patiently. When the right time of God came, then we see him, uh, him where God want, wanted him to be. 
And also I can think of the example of Jabez in 1 Chronicles chapter 4 verse 9 and 10. Jabez, if we look at the meaning of Jabez, it means the son of the sorrow. He was a, he was a boy who was born in sorrow or he was a boy who reminded his mother of the sorrow. But uh, his name was not a sweet name. But he's praying to God, he's calling on the name of the Lord God and saying that God bless me indeed. You enlarge my territory, let your hand be upon me, let your protection be upon me so that I may not cause pain anymore. So he, he knew his life, his presence was causing pain to others but he was telling, he was calling on the name of the Lord and saying let me not cause pain anymore and God has heard his prayer. If we look into the New Testament, we see Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, he was blind, he was blind and he was begging on the street. But when he heard that Jesus is passing by, he called him on his name, he was saying, crying out aloud, son of David, have mercy on me. And that time the people were telling him, don't shout, don't say anything, don't disturb him. But the more the people said, keep quiet, uh, the louder his voice was there and was telling, son of David, have mercy on me. When he was crying out all out, Jesus heard his voice, Jesus stopped there and there we see Bertimaeus is, uh, Bertimaeus has, uh, had, uh, his sight was uh, restored there. So we can overcome, we can overcome the obstacles that is, uh, that comes before us because of the grace of God, because God will strengthen us to do that. The fifth point, we move on to the fifth one, it is renewing our mind. Renew our mind. If we want to have a relationship with God, if we want to go to the next spiritual level, renewing our mind is very important. Uh, I take out this familiar verse, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Especially, I would like to uh, read verse 2 where it is written, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what that is good acceptable and perfect will of God. So uh, being a Christian, if you want to have a relationship with God, it is leaving something and cleaving unto God. We are leaving the world and uh, we are growing with God. And uh, so these verses do not be conformed with the world, not to go with the world, but we have to, we are cleaving with God and that needs the renewing of our mind. We need to renew our mind. Uh, Romans, uh, Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. There again, Paul is saying, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Proverbs says that as a man thinks, so is he. As a, as a man thinks, so is he. So our thinking will also chart our destination. Uh, exam, for example, I bring out the thinking of the Israelites. When they come to the border of the land of Canaan, Moses sent 12 spies in the, to, uh, to spy in the land of Canaan. So when they come back with the report, 10 people are saying that uh, the people, the land is good. Uh, just as God has said that it is, the land is good, it is abundant with the vegetations. But the people are giants. Uh, the people are giants. We cannot go and overcome them. We cannot fight them. But there are two people, Joshua, Joshua and Caleb, who says that, no, we can do it. God has promised us, so he will give us that land. We can conquer that land. We can have dominion over those people. But these people are saying that, no, we are like grasshoppers in front of them. Actually, God had already promised them. God had given, God had shown miraculous things before them. God had done wonderful things before them. But still, their mind was not renewed. Even after testing the goodness of the Lord, even after looking at the miracles every day of their life, every day they were having manna from heaven, even that did not change their mind. Even that did not renew their mind. And they became a cause of negativ negativity in the, uh, among the people. So they were saying, we are like grasshoppers. That's, that was their thinking. And they were not focusing on what God can do, but they are focusing on only their limitation, their weakness was saying there. Ephesians chapter 4 verse uh, 23 says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So if you look at the preceding verse, it says in verse 20, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. We need to put off this old man, but be renewed in the spirit of your mind. 
And in verse 24, it says that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And that's the, uh, that is the that is the apex of the Christian life, being conformed to the image of Christ, being like His Son. So we are putting on the old man, being renewed in the spirit, we are putting on the new man, just as we were created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So renewing of our mind to grow in the spiritual life is very important, without which we cannot grow in any areas of our life. The sixth point is invading the enemy's territory. We are growing in the Lord, we are in our spiritual journey and we, it is also very important for us to identify our enemy. If we look at Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 again 12, it is written, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our war, our enemy and the warfare is a spiritual warfare. And uh, the second, for second Corinthians chapter 11 verse 40, 14 says that Satan comes even as an angel of light. That means he is deceptive. He is the father of lies. And when we are growing in the Lord, when we are pursuing God, many hindrances will also be brought by Satan, uh, Satan to obstruct our way. And we need to understand his strategy. Uh, two of the things that he usually does among the people of God or among the people of the world is he, the first thing that he wants the people is to be afraid of him. When we are afraid of him, he becomes powerful and he can take hold uh, in our life and then he can, uh, he can rule our life through, uh, by uh, putting his plan in our life. So when we are afraid, what, he, what is he doing is he is becoming the authority over our life. We are not fearing God but fearing Satan. And the other thing is he wants people to deny his existence. So when we deny his existence, also when we think that Satan is not there, so uh, but Satan is doing all kinds of work, we, we will not recognize. So without recognizing his strategy, without being aware, he is aware of his strategy or his presence, there is no way that we can go and invade the, inv uh, invade the enemy's territory. So it's good, it's uh, important for us that we know who our enemy is when we are growing spiritually, when we are spreading the gospel, and, and when we expose who he is, and when we expose the way he works, that's the way uh, Satan is angry at us. And he will try to uh, bring problem in our life. But if we know his, know his tactics, if we know how he works, then we can uh, win over him. We can invade his territory. We can establish God's kingdom through God's help in our life. And uh, now we come to the seventh point. The seventh point is thinking victorious thoughts. It's, um, we can say it's a little bit connected with the renewing of our mind. We renew our mind by the word of God. When we, go, when we read the word of God, our mind is renewed. We know what His will is. And also, we always have to think the victorious thoughts in our life. Second, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57 says, 57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gives us victory. And if we look at Romans chapter 8, verse 37 also, it is said that we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. If you look at chapter Romans chapter 6 and 7 and 8, there Paul is discussing about the uh, carnal the carnality and the spirituality, um, a struggle that is that is within us, and uh, a struggle that is within us. And we want to do the, the the things that we do not want to do. We do it. The things we do want to do, we cannot do it. There is a great struggle uh, inside of us, and sometimes it's very uh, difficult to overcome it. But God, but here it is said that we are more than conquerors, and Jesus will give us that victory. And the the secret of being having a victorious life is to be is to submit ourselves to the Spirit of the Lord. Romans chapter eight verse fourteen says, "As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God." So uh, we are pursuing Him. We are being a genuine believer. And this word says we are the sons of God when we are led by the Spirit of God. When we walk according to the will of the, uh, according to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we can have a victorious life. And the difference between the worldliness and God.
godliness is just a renewed mind. Our mind shapes our life. When we think victorious things, uh, uh, we can do it. If you think you can, you can. If you think you cannot, you will never. And now I come to the last point that is yielding to God. Yielding to God is nothing but knowing the truth and obeying it. There are many people, what we, uh, the tragedy, uh, the tragedy among the Christian people is, we know so much of the thing that is written in the Bible, but we do not practice it. But what God wants us is that we yield to Him, that we surrender to Him. After knowing His will, after knowing what He wants to do, after having, uh, after maintaining our relationship with Him, we, He wants us to obey Him. He wants us to surrender to Him. Uh, there is a quotation which says, if the Lord is not the Lord of all, He is not the Lord at all. So if we are giving Him some time, we are investing time in the for the purpose of God, we are renewing our mind. But if we are not obeying His word, then uh, we are still living an incomplete Christian life. Psalm number 40 verse 8, there the psalmist says, I delight to do your will. Psalm number 143 verse 10, there is a prayer, the psalmist is praying, Lord, Teach me to do your will. Even the psalmist know that it is not only knowing the law of the Lord, but uh, to do his will is also important in our life. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. So it is not only knowing the truth, but also following it. John chapter 10 verse 27 says, My sheep knows my path. Uh, John chapter 10 verse 27 says, My sheep hear my voice. So Jesus is telling that my sheep will hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. So uh, we can uh, we can connect this with uh, John chapter 15 verses 1 to 6 where Jesus is abiding me and I will abide in you. And how is this abiding coming? Because we are obeying him. Obeying his command, and that's how our relationship is growing with him. Even Jesus, when he came to this earth, he knew the pain that he was going through. You will be going through when going through the time of persecution, or through the time of crucifixion. But he was he was saying at last, Father, if it's your will, your will. If it's your will, he, he will, If it's your will, let this cup be removed away from me. But he was telling that, let your will be done. And when he was teaching the prayers to the disciples also, he was teaching the same thing. May your kingdom come. Let your, your kingdom come. Uh, let your will be done as it is in earth, uh, as, as it is in, uh, uh, in heaven, let it be done on the earth also. So he wanted his will to be done. And his will is done in our life when we obey him. He, is re he has already revealed his will. And we, if we have a relationship with God, we will show through our obedience. So this is how we will we can maintain the priority in our life. Thank you.